you watched the previous video in my Rosetta Stone series, then you know what the stone once was. Don't worry if you haven't seen it by the way, you don't need to watch these in order, I've put a link to it below so you can check it out afterwards. This week, I'm telling the story of how the stone ended up in the British Museum, and maybe begin to show how the Rosetta Stone is more an Egyptological treasure than an Egyptian one, from a certain point of view. We can't quite fit in the gap of close to 2000 years between when the stele was constructed and when it was found by French troops in 1799, in part because of its historical insignificance. We just lost track of it. So, Napoleon led a famous campaign to conquer Egypt in an attempt to establish dominion over that region so he could come out of the Mediterranean blasting and hoped to take control of the Atlantic from the British Empire. Egypt at the time was under the direct rule of the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans, who were neutral in Europe's infighting at the time, failed to fend off the French attack. The invasion also had a scientific purpose, for Napoleon brought with him his savants, who were there to document Egypt's treasures and seize them for France. There were some notable names among the savants, including Joseph Fourier, whom you'll no doubt have heard of if you travel in mathematics or physics circles. It's sometimes said that this endeavour was the birth of Egyptology, but I'd probably qualify that as modern Egyptology. The Egyptians themselves had been doing Egyptology since the earliest part of the country's Islamic era, hindered, as everyone ultimately was, by their inability to decipher the idiosyncratic pictograms of the ancients. The Royal Navy was having none of Bonaparte's schemes. John, before let him see, has made me angry and his forces were pursued, and at one point in a comedy of errors overtaken, by the Royal Navy, a fleet under the command of the then Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson. While performing repairs on the newly renamed Fort Julian, French forces found the Rosetta Stone among the fort's building materials, where it seemed to be awaiting use as filler for the fort's walls. With the scientific mission in mind, one of Napoleon's aides, called Bouchard, saw that the stone was potentially important, and had it saved. It was in this time that it was given the name Pierre de Rosette, Rosetta Stone, and Napoleon just about clapped eyes on it before peacing out to Mother France. And credit where it's due, it was quickly realised that because there were three scripts on the stone, it was likely that they were writing the same thing three times. Greek was a common language among academics at the time, and so it was reported as early as 1799, the same year it was found, that the Rosetta Stone could hold the key to understanding Egyptian writing, and through that, unlocking an entire period of history. Prints were made of the stone, using the stone itself as a printing block in some cases, and the prints were sent back to Europe, where the race to decipher the hieroglyphs began in earnest. More on that next week. Napoleon's departure was the beginning of the end of the Republic's occupation of Egypt, and a year and a half later, a combined British and Ottoman force besieged Alexandria, where France was staging its last stand. The French general, Manu, surrendered, and the terms of the surrender included all of the French acquisitions, notes and samples becoming public property, functionally the property of the British and Ottoman generals, to do with as they liked. Manu really had integrated, by the way, he'd married into a wealthy Egyptian family and converted to Islam into the bargain. I'm not sure if he took his new wife and new religion back to France with him, but either way, back to France he went. In fine French tradition, the surrender of the leadership didn't convince everyone under their command that the matter was yet settled. Many of the scholars who'd been making meticulous notes and plundering ancient Egypt for all it was worth felt that they had a stake in the things they discovered. After some back and forth with the British, including a dire threat from a scholar named Saint-Hilaire that they would rather destroy what they'd done than hand it over, a compromise was reached. Artifacts like the Rosetta Stone were to be handed over, while certain things like geological and biological samples were considered the private property of the savants. The stone was handed over with some grumbling, and made its way on a captured French frigate to England, where by royal decree it was placed in the British Museum at some point in the spring of 1802. It has very rarely left the museum since that day, most notably during wartime when it and other artefacts were in danger of being destroyed, and it's left London only once since 1802, when it was on loan to the Louvre in the 70s as part of a celebration of the work of the French scholar Champollion, who was pivotal in translating 
completing the stone's inscription. Now, it is one of, if not the, most popular item in the British Museum. At the time, the stone's inscription was causing a stir among philologists around Europe. They finally had something written in both Greek and Egyptian, and it was a matter of persistence, ingenuity, and not a little bit of luck that finally led to the first ancient Egyptian word to be read with any kind of accuracy for close to two millennia. Next week, the third part of the story. How this piece of scrap construction material became one of the world's most universally recognised icons of linguistics. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I hope you'll let me know what you thought, as well as doing all those liking and subscribing things that make the numbers go up and fuel my fragile ego. While I've got you, I'm going to do a live stream on the 31st of October where I'll be reading some spooky stories with an ancient Egyptian theme. It'll be pretty casual and it'll be here on YouTube, so be sure to follow me on Twitter at armchair underscore Egypt or join my Discord channel with the link in the description so you don't miss it when I go live. On the subject of precious things the modern world owes much to, thanks as always to my backers at patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You know who they are, because here they are. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.